strike of a light pole. I just air it out and leave with the mic broke. Your micro, I'm hard body like Tyco. Heavy metal Chevys with nitro. Addicted to the vapors of paper. Hypnotic to the thirst. I'm pulling off criminal capers. I know the cocaine crackery stinks, but that's what it is. Surrounded by the khakis and mints. We move. And welcome back once again to Ratchet and Clank, up your arsenal developer commentary. I am Tony Garcia. And I'm Mike Stout. And now we are going to get into one of the weirder features we had in Ratchet and Clank going to up your arsenal. Uh, and I think you have a lot to say about this one. I do. Uh, now, while I wasn't, I didn't have anything to do with uh, the final product on here. That was Sean Whistler and Ken Strickland. But uh, I did a lot of initial design on it. I played... I played the fuck out of Mega Man X. And really, my vision for this game was to make Mega Man X, except with Captain Quark. I take it from what you were talking about earlier, it didn't quite turn out that way. I don't know how to talk about this without breaking rule number one. <laughs> because there's a lot of pent-up, stored bitterness that I think Ken, uh, Sean, and I all have regarding this feature. Let's approach it this way. Yes. Uh, you say what you're going to say, and in the editing, if we find things questionable, we'll uh, we'll dub it over with something pleasant. Oh, like I like kittens or whatever. Right. Yeah. I think that's probably the way to go. Okay. So uh, for this entire fucking thing. Yeah, that's not a great start. Let's. That's not the best start to the whole thing. But okay. <laughs> so. We wanted this to be like a real old school throwback. That was a really important to me and to Ken and to Sean. We all have a lot of love for old school SNES games of the Mega Man type. Okay. Right, that running and gunning, Metroidvania. I know you hate that term. Sort of uh, uh, a vibe. But we, you know, we wanted to do it in 3D and you know as a a mini game. Little did we know that doing this is enough work for an entire fucking game. Interactive portion of episode one. Booty is in the eye of the beholder. Let's see. So at this point, you only have your fists, I remember. It's a gorgeous game, isn't it? It, it looks really good. I mean, one of the great things about this sort of game, uh, I just rem offhand I remember, is that since we're doing so much less... Uh, CPU wise, we could go nuts with like those effects and stuff that were going on. Oh yeah, on the characters. So on the the Quark Vid comics, uh, we are going to be joined silently by Mary, who is going to take the controller and play, because uh, Tony and I recorded some of this level and I was fucking horrible at it. <laughs> so uh, uh, so we're gonna have Mary do it, and so uh, any mistakes you see may be me. But they also may be Mary, so she might just suck. We'll see. So let me to play devil's advocate for a second, Mike. Yeah. Um, you were talking about how in your original vision was to be more like a Mega Man game, more trial and error sort of approach. Uh, more like a Mega Man X style. So le less of the trial and error, but more... Um, it was a slower paced platforming because, right. because you added in shooting. Well, so here's my uh, my question. When you look at Ratchet and Clank as it was, uh, it was a game that started off as a platformer and started to, as it progressed, remove those slower style platformer elements and made it more streamlined and more approachable in general. And so couldn't, wouldn't you think that maybe part of the backlash in that kind of game was that Ratchet and Clank was moving forward from that kind of stuff, and so wouldn't it make sense for if we were going to do a 2D game, it would it would feel a bit out of place to have something so retro in something that we were trying to make more progressive and more modern. You know what? You sound just like. <laughs> I don't think I want to talk to you anymore. Just because you have good arguments doesn't mean that you're allowed to. No, uh... I, I, like I'm trying to play devil's advocate. No, here. no. I mean, isn't it, isn't that a reasonable? approach to come at it. Right? Abs it is absolutely a reasonable approach, and that was the main reason why the the game is the way it is. Uh, the the thing is, is when... <laughs> Thanks, Mary. It's okay. 
Um, so that is the reason why the game is the way it is, because um, when you're a designer, you're often designing things for yourself. Right. Uh, and the better you get at design, the the you know, and the longer you've done it, the less this is a temptation to do. But at this point in my design career, I was I was still very much designing for myself, and I really wanted to design a Mega Man game. You know, uh, and the the greater health of Ratchet and Clank be damned. I wanted to show them that it could be done. Right. So, uh, uh, and I, I think there were a lot of us who were very passionate about sort of 2D side scrollers, who who felt that way, and that's why it was so disappointing. But you're right. Uh, in the in the end, this is probably. It's like the the direction we ended up going was probably better for the game, but who knows? Well, I mean, it still seems kind of weird, and I'm, I guess I guess this is my question is that even as it is, it's still kind of a bit out of place. Um, it's a very weird shift in terms of what's going on, and was that ever a concern with you guys that it would be such a radical tonal shift in terms of gameplay for players like in focus tests how do people react to oh all of a sudden i'm playing this sort of old school 2d platforming game oh people people were not very happy with that um the there's there's a, a rule that i like to teach younger designers that i didn't follow myself at this point in my career which is uh if the player didn't sign up for the the thing you're designing you really shouldn't make that thing super hard. And this thing is super hard, and it is not at all what the player is signing up for. I mean, at this point, like, this is way before, you know, um, the DS was super popular, and, uh, uh, and the, uh, uh, you know, the iPhone games and stuff, where 2D has made kind of a comeback in recent years. Mm -hmm. But uh, gameplay on a 2D plane at this point was, like, committing suicide if you were a game developer. It was just not popular. People did not like doing it. Um, and I never understood that, but, you know, so getting them to play in 2D was really hard. For a lot of kids, this is the first 2D game they've ever played. And I guess here's my other question. Um, so, I feel like I'm interviewing you about this thing, but I think it. that's probably the best approach given the, of the animosity you still feel and the attachment you still feel to this sort of game. My question is really... You said it at the beginning that you didn't know what you were really signing up for when you were when you were doing this. I mean, you really had um, you or two people, a programmer and a designer, that was handling this. Sort of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Like, even if you were to keep your original design, do you think you could have really pulled it off to the level that you would be happy with in the end, given the constraints that you had to work with? No way. Uh, it, I don't think it would have been possible at all. Uh, so, I mean, given that, isn't this, the, in the end, sort of a reasonable compromise to have it sort of scaled down this way rather than... Isn't it better to have something that morphed into something that was a little bit less your design rather than to have something that was what you wanted but that you couldn't achieve and it was just sort of this failed uh, attempt of what you really wanted to you know what? I'm going to decline to answer that question <laughs> on the grounds that it may serve to incriminate me. I'm just saying, for me personally, the way I look at it, I'd rather... I, it would hurt me much more to see something in the game that didn't live up to what I had hoped it to be than to see something that had changed into something else. I think you just described Ratchet 2 for me. <laughs> Uh, you're a you're absolutely right, and uh, it it sort of illustrates what the process of growing up as a designer means, like uh, becoming more experienced. It's being able to sacrifice your original vision for something that is better or more appropriate is such a huge skill to have as a designer, or really as any kind of a developer. I mean, I'm sure you had to run into that a lot when you were programming too, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, there was definitely a bit, uh, in the Dr. Nefarious fight, which I guess we'll get to, where I, I mean, I had a similar conflict with the Dr. Nefarious fight, uh, when I was doing him. 
Now, the difference and, between you and me is that I don't think you ever compromised on anything. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think you I always think got your way. I think that's a bit unfair. I think, I think that's always... an unfair criticism of me. Oh, Tony. But yeah, um, it, it, I think that that the Quark comics and sort of the lessons I learned from it and it, pretty much exactly what you just said illustrates what it's like to be a designer and to at the beginning ownership is very important and at the end just making something fucking cool is important mm -hmm. and the process of going from owning something cool to just collaboratively making something cool is a is a really neat sort of journey well i think this is i'm I, this is kind of what i'm getting at uh i think this is sort of the the notion I was leading to the whole time was that I think, like you describe the the Quark comics as your vision and what you wanted and, you know, that kind of stuff. And I understand that perspective, but isn't the better perspective to have as game developers that nothing is ours, right? Ratchet and Clank doesn't belong to us. Despite the fact that we're making this commentary, and I know that's a very hypocritical thing to say, <laughs> but Ratchet and Clank isn't ours, and no one feature is really ours. It belongs to everybody that worked on it. And I think that's something that gets lost in game development a lot, and not just by people who work on it. I think even people on the outside looking in sort of tend to attribute things to to particular individuals or you know, or something like that when it's very hard to say even any specific feature and attribute it to one person. Yeah. And to sort of claim ownership for one thing is is a little backwards, I think, right? Because it's all collaborative. It's a very collaborative process. Um, yeah, it's funny. I didn't think that was the direction you were going to take that. Right. Uh, well, uh, and so uh, what I'm saying is, isn't that sort of, to hold on to that perspective that um, this isn't this isn't the way I intended it, that's where the conflict generally arises. When you have that sort of level of attachment to things, it's it's a weird place because having that level of attachment definitely drives you to excel to another level, right? When you're that into something, you will put your heart and soul into it. Yeah. But that's also where the majority of conflict arises, where people are less willing to compromise their singular vision. And finding that balance between the sense of ownership and the sense of compromise and teamwork is a very difficult line. I agree. That's all I got. <laughs> uh, but uh, what was I going to say? I, I was going to add one thing to it. Um, we aren't really making this game for us. Uh, mm -hmm. Often you're making games that other people want to play. And that's, that's a tough thing to kind of get used to. But as a designer, it's something that in sort of fills out your everyday life, right? This, is, this game is for the player. The things you are designing are for the player. And your role as a designer on a game is to be the voice of the player in the design process. Mm -hmm. Oh, shit! Okay. This was my idea. <laughs> After we've just done all of that, this is right. me right here. <laughs> okay. I uh, uh, since we tested on Ratchet One, I remembered that there was a uh, uh, that as a Gadgetron employee, you, you got an employee discount, but they said that it wouldn't. Uh, it said that it wouldn't kick in for like another uh, three years, and we made this game three years after Ratchet and Clank One. And it takes place with Gadgetron in the in the the correct galaxy, right? Right. So I said, why not? If they have a save from Ratchet and Clank One, let them you know get the uh, 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 let them get their employee discount. And so right. that was that was all me, except for all of the work that was done to make it happen. <laughs> Besides that, all me. So I think we're done with uh, with this level now. I think so. And uh, and with that, I'm going to try to sign off. And if I fail, it's up to you, Tony. Okay. Are, are you ready? I'm ready. All right. So for developer commentary, I'm Mike Stout. And I am Tony Garcia. And we'll catch you next time. Nice. I did good, huh, Tony?